We must get the resources to our allies' camps before the assault begins. Abadakas, I came. Some of Seleucus's men have snuck behind our lines. We cannot allow them to steal our supplies. Look to the north, my lord. The battle is starting. This is the end of the road for you, Antigonus. You cannot possibly stand up to the combined might of the Diadochi. I am the only true heir of Keep up the pressure, men! We will have these dogs on the run before long! Oh, you coward, Lysimachus! Tear those abominations down, and let us fight like real men, like we did in the old days. You must abandon the fight, my lord. That ghastly wound cannot go untreated. You will continue the battle without you. Is this the best you have, Antigonus? Alexander must be rolling in his grave, seeing you fight this poorly. So you are the man that they sent to face me. Young, Pyrrhus, a nobody from the mountains of... What was the name of that little kingdom again? This is getting us nowhere. Pull back and form defensive lines. Once Spiros has cleared the eastern flank, we will charge again and envelop the enemy. We have crushed the enemy's eastern flank. Send word to Antigonus to commence the counterattack. We were too late, my lord. Antigonus' line has broken and he has begun to retreat. This cannot be. We must cover their retreat as best we can. After me, men. Allied town center. We cannot let them raise another. We have done all that we can. Let us leave this cursed battlefield. Despite having never lost a battle during his 80 years on Earth, Antigonus lost both the war and his life at Ipsus. The retreat left Pyrrhus sour. He had routed the enemy on his flank impressing his superiors with his courage. And yet, it was all for naught. For a time, Pyrrhus wondered if he had tied himself to a sinking ship, yet he remained loyal to Demetrius. In time, that loyalty would pay off, but not in the way that he had expected. For most people, war is like a bad marriage. An unending affair of strife, bitterness, and glimmering moments of joy that serve only to prolong the suffering. But for Pyrrhus, fighting came as naturally as breathing. Following a war between Demetrius and the king of Egypt, Pyrrhus was sent to the desert kingdom as a hostage. Here, his luck finally returned. 
His many war stories made an impression on the Egyptian king, as did his ability to laugh off any insult thrown at him. With such a capable friend in his court, the king sensed an opportunity. He equipped Pyrrhus with a small army and the ships needed to transport it to Epirus, hoping to forge in him an ally on the Greek mainland. The prospect of retaking Epirus thrilled Pyrrhus, as did the chance to exploit the chaos in nearby Macedon to seize both realms for himself. At long last, the exiled king was returning home. Neoptolemus has set his guards on high alert. Let us seek out the weakest point in his defense and launch our attack there. Rutger, have it. Quick work of these guards. Epirus will be ours again before Neoptolemus knows what hit him. Rutgers, I can. I'm a doctor, I can. I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor. Somos. Somos. Blerbus. Somos. This senseless bloodshed must come to an end, you lest Epirus be reduced to rubble. I am willing to share the throne with you, Pyrrhus, for the good of our people. We have retaken my old kingdom, but this is only the beginning. The time has come to expand our domain into Macedon. Dark tidings, your highness. It appears that your old friend Demetrius plans to take Macedon for himself. His armies will soon arrive from the east. Right. My lord, Macedon is divided among several factions. We could take advantage of these divisions and take oh, them out yes. one by one. Or we could ally with one of them against the other too. I would be happy to ally with you, Pyrrhus. My brother Antipater murdered our mother and took the throne for himself. That was my plan. And that fiend just stole it from me. Very well. If you are building an alliance to seize Macedon, I will simply have to do the same. Bombus. Bombus. Your Highness, we have uncovered the plot by Neoptolemus to poison you. Apparently, he plans to take Epirus for himself. If information like this can leak so easily from his camp, then surely he does not inspire much loyalty in his subjects. Let us strike at him first, oh, yes. and give the people of Epirus a proper ruler to look up to. Babadakis. You discovered my plot, eh? Very well. If I cannot kill you with poison, I shall do so with sword and spear. Epirus is mine, and mine alone. I am undone by my idiot brother and some goat herd from the armpit of the world. How could this happen? Babadakis. Evil 
Dimitrius' army has left port, your highness. They will arrive at our shores in less than five minutes. Your prowess in battle is impressive. That much I will give you, Pyrrhus. But this is not the end. The throne of Macedon will yet be mine. This. It is a Bombus. shame that Bombus. we had to Bombus. reunite under circumstances Bombus. such as this. Bombus. Yet here Bombus. you are, trying to Bombus. claim Bombus. a throne Bombus. that is mine by right. You leave me no choice but to declare war. Seems that I underestimated you, old friend. Oh well, I would have needed a ward for this land when I return to the east for the next campaign season anyway. I will allow you to keep Macedon for now. Neoptolemus is no more! I should have dealt with that ornerless cur long ago! It would have been booed out of the theater for his confusing, overlapping plotlines. Stories, after all, should be simple, straightforward, and with an entertaining hero to cheer for. All of the things that real politics lack. At the end of the war, Pyrrhus came to blows with his old master Demetrius. Each led their forces against the other, and, in what must have been an act of divine mischief, the two armies marched right past each other. As Demetrius raided across Epirus, a second army, commanded by his finest general, Pantacus, met Pyrrhus in battle. Pantacus challenged the Epirot king to a duel, and Pyrrhus accepted. With thousands of men watching and cheering for their leaders, the two commanders fought man against man. Swords clashed, shields buckled, and for a short while, the brutality of the war was distilled into the shapes of those men. Those two kingdoms personified. Pantaucus managed a single strike on Pyrrhus, but not long after, Pyrrhus wounded his opponent in the thigh and neck. Pantaucus was forced to retreat, and Pyrrhus claimed victory. His boldness earned him the nickname the Eagle. But his triumph proved hollow when the war ended in a stalemate. For all his efforts, Pyrrhus returned to Epirus empty-handed. Pyrrhus now had neither enemies to fight nor pressing disputes to manage. It was the first period of prolonged peace that he had experienced in many years. And he hated every minute of it. Men like him are built for war, and they start to break down come peacetime. Pyrrhus was looking for any excuse to rally his men again. And he soon found one. The Greek colonies in Italy had long been regarded as unimportant outposts in barbarian lands. But now they were under threat from the ever-expanding Republic of Rome. When a call for aid came from the city-state of Tarentum, Pyrrhus jumped at the opportunity. All that I could do was try and convince him to stay and enjoy his hard-won peace. If we can conquer Rome, he told me as he was drawing up his invasion plans, all of Italy will soon be ours. And if we can defeat the Romans, then Sicily, Libya and Carthage should be easy pickings. And when all of these lands are yours, what will you do? I asked. He replied, why, we will celebrate, of course, 
We will sing and drink and be at ease after all of our troubles. Then what, pray tell, is preventing us from drinking and passing our time right now, instead of starting yet another war? If happiness and celebration is your goal, my friend, then you have already achieved it. Pyrrhus could give no good answer, but his mind was already set. He would become the liberator of the Greeks in Italy and put the Roman barbarians in their place. However, a raging storm hit our fleet as we sailed for Italy. With his armies scattered to the winds, Pyrrhus made landfall near Tarentum with only a fraction of the men that he had assembled. Our forces were scattered by the storm, but we cannot go looking for survivors yet. We must hurry to Tarentum before the Romans assault the town. is timely, my lord. The main Roman army has laid siege to our allies in Heraclea. We will provide you with whatever resources we can spare if you drive these barbarians out of Megale Eras. Abedakis. You keep buzzing around me like an irksome fly, Pyrrhus. Does your famed courage only stretch to fighting small garrisons, or are you man enough to face me in the field? Many of the smaller Greek settlements in Italy are under siege, and some have already fallen to the Romans. If we are to win this war, we must liberate as many as we can. Free at last! You can count on us to support the war effort. We have captured another Greek settlement. These Romans build organized camps and deploy their armies in neat formations. They do not Probably seem not like good. barbarians to me. The time has come. Let us show these oh, decadent colonizers the true might of Rome. Rocket, oh no. Abadakis. That blasted storm sent us far off course. We are glad to be reunited with you, my lord. Claire is saved, but the Romans still control a camp near Asculum. Let us march north and defeat them in their own backyard. The Romans are sending raiders towards our position. We may have to deal with them, unless we want them at our backs when we face the brunt of Livinus' army. Somos. Ah, there you are, my lord. I must say, sailing straight into a raging storm was not your brightest idea. This will be slow. Let us clear a way to Asculum and establish a forward base. With supplies now coming in from so many Greek towns, we can equip our forces with even better weapons and gear. 
We some knights have fought the Romans for generations and would be happy to lend you our support. We ask only that you clear out the Romans occupying our capital. You Greeks were once a great civilization, but your neglect and decadence will be your downfall. When this day is over, all of Italy will belong to Rome. That is the last of the settlements. All of Megala Hellas is under our control. Thank you for your help. We will provide you with whatever we can. From this camp, we can strike at the Roman army. This is not the end. What you saw today was but a fraction of Rome's true power. We will be back. At Heraclea, the Romans fled in panic before Pyrrhus's war elephants. When we fought them again at Asculum, they had already adapted to this strange new weapon and they sent out twin chariots with long robes between them to down the fearsome creatures. The Italian expedition never became the quick victory that Pyrrhus had hoped for. The Tarentines seemed content to let him do their fighting for them. And while he bested the Romans twice in battle, each victory came at the cost of thousands of his best men. One more victory like this and I will be undone. He told me at one point, and I feared that it was true. Yet he refused to give up hope. Pyrrhus's ambition was to build a Western Empire from which he would conquer all of Alexander's old domains. If Italy could not be easily cowed, he would simply have to turn elsewhere. Despite suffering two crushing defeats, the Romans quickly recouped their strength. They refused to sign any peace treaty so long as Pyrrhus remained in Italy. Seeing no clear way forward, Pyrrhus turned his gaze to Sicily. Much like in Italy, the Greek colonies here were threatened by foreign invasion, this time from the Carthaginian Empire and its Mamertine allies. Carthage had dominated the Western Sea for centuries with its wealth and vast mercenary armies. Despite this, its grip on Sicily was tenuous, as the rugged island was difficult for any conqueror to hold. But if any man could succeed in ruling Sicily, Pyrrhus reasoned that it would be him. Quick march, men! If Syracuse falls, we will have no hope of liberating the rest of Sicily. Oklahoma? Save the Carthaginians and Mamertines from every corner of the island if we are to liberate these people. I hear that you brought the Romans to shame twice, Pyrrhus. As much as I commend the effort, I cannot allow you to repeat that feat here. Sicily is not for anyone to take. Well, except us. You have our thanks, my lord. These mercenaries have pestered us for far too long. 
we will give you what little we can, and I am sure that the nearby villages will do the same. We had these poor Sicilians' wealth well protected in our stores, and then you came along and stole it from us. I mean, from them. What a disgrace. <laughs> you are building ships against the greatest naval power on the face of the earth. My good man, I admire your sense of humor. <laughs> you are true to your reputation, Pyrrhus. Sweeping in at the last second to save us all. Syracuse and all Greeks in Sicily owe you thanks. have liberated the Sicilian heartland. Now the Carthaginians have nowhere to hide but their coastal holdings. Last night, I dreamed that Mount Etna awoke from her slumber and buried your army in hot magma. Imagine my disappointment to wake up and find you still here. Pyrrhus has captured one of our strongholds. We must reinforce our positions as soon as possible. If the Carthaginians are sending reinforcements, we must change our tactics. We have asked little of the locals so far, but we will need everything they can supply us with if we are to win this war. Umbus. After everything we have done Umbus. for you, this is how you treat us? You are Umbus. even worse than the Carthaginians. We will never accept you as a king. Ha ha ha! With friends like you, the Sicilians need no enemies. has alienated. With many of the locals, perhaps coming here was a mistake after all. Pyrrhus had bested another great empire. Yet, as so many times before, his victory was short-lived. As the war dragged on, he became increasingly suspicious of the Greeks who had called him there. Their refusal to give everything to the war effort was, in his mind, akin to treason. When he executed one of the men who had invited him to Sicily in the first place, the public turned against him. Pyrrhus, they claimed, had become just the sort of tyrant they had wanted to escape. With the entire island in revolt, it seemed that Pyrrhus was out of options. Just as one door slammed shut, another opened, and Pyrrhus was quick to jump through it. While he had been occupied in Sicily, the Romans had regrouped and once more set their sights on Tarentum. Desperate for help, the Greeks called on Pyrrhus, the only ruler who had ever answered their pleas. With Sicily lost and the Mamertine and Carthaginian fleets shadowing his every move, Pyrrhus set out for Italy. Yet, after so many hard-won victories that had spilled out in the sand, doubt gnawed at him. He had bested the Romans before, and he could do it again. But at what cost? Like Sisyphus in the old tales, he had been rolling his rock up the hill over and over, only for it to tumble back down and for the challenge to begin anew. Perhaps he would be satisfied once he had beaten the Romans a third time. Perhaps he would then return to Epirus and live out his days in peace. 
Perhaps. Sides, but this is not over. Sink the Carthaginian fleet and send the Mamertines to Hades. Sound the retreat! We have already driven the Epirots from Sicily. Let us not gamble away our remaining strength on folly. We have survived, but we cannot rest. The Romans advance on Tarentum and our Samnite allies as we speak. Our last hope for victory in Italy is to drive them back to Rome. The situation is dire, but if you can defend us while we build a wonder, the Romans will eventually have no choice but to retreat. <laughs> Great Zeus! It's Pyrrhus! We have been lost at sea ever since that storm hit us. Now, we are ready to begin the invasion of Italy. Wait. What do you mean, second invasion? Say your prayers. Today is the day that you enter oblivion. Rock it. You think that you Omnis, can force Omnis, our Omnis. surrender by constructing that affront Omnis. to good taste that you call a wonder? Well, two can play at that game. Rogan? The Tarantines have completed their wonder. We must defend it until the Romans pull back. Ombis. Alamas. My lord, we noticed while we were adrift that Beneventum's defenses are weak along the coast. Alamas. If we attack by sea, we could skirt around the Roman fortifications. Humbus. That ramshackle building that you call Humbus. a wonder has stood for long enough. Humbus. Call us barbarians, yet you would destroy such a work of art. Have you no honor? The Greeks have bested us a third time. Sound the retreat! If we do not return in haste, we will find Rome sacked before long. Despite the April's valiant efforts, the Battle of Beneventum was ultimately a failure. The Romans had learned from Pyrrhus' battle tactics, and they managed to scare the enemy war elephants into stampeding into the Epirot lines. 
Pyrrhus was forced to retreat. After five years of campaigning, all that he could do was to leave the Greek colonies to their fate. The Romans were relieved. Pyrrhus had been the fiercest opponent that they had ever faced, and they were honored to have fought such a powerful foe. As we set sail for Epirus, Pyrrhus and I took to conversing on the ship's deck. I told him that he reminded me of the myth of Sisyphus, and he, as he so often did, simply laughed it off. You still do not understand, do you, Kineas? He said. I will never stop struggling. To do so is to give up on life. You call it a curse, to push that rock up the hill forever and ever. But it is no curse. It is the one thing that a man can do when faced with impossible odds. It is his sole recourse in a universe that could not care less about his wishes. Perhaps it is pointless in the end, he said. And perhaps I will die before achieving what I set out to do. It does not matter. If you give up on your ambitions, then you might as well be dead. For you are already dead inside. I listened closely to him. As he finished, and as the coast of Epirus appeared to rise out of the waves far ahead, I could not help but smile. You are an idiot, my friend, I told him, if not by those exact words. The ways of the gods are incomprehensible. Far more predictable is the path walked by a man who considers himself a god. So too it was for Sargon, the greatest conqueror Mesopotamia has ever known. Like the legendary shepherd that founded our great city, Sargon seemed to have descended from heaven a grown man, crafted by the gods to rule the world. But while his true origins remain a mystery, his earthly story began here, in Kish, a place so beautiful that even the lustrous words of the poets cannot do it justice. Back when I, Ushar, was still a man of youthful strength, Kish was ruled by Urza Baba. If the gods had molded Sargon from clouds and ether, Urza Baba was made from common clay. Nothing about him was exceptional, save for his fondness for fine food, extravagant clothes, and luxurious wine. Urza Baba had appointed Sargon as his cupbearer, and the shy, unassuming adolescent served him wine and kept him company in many a lonely hour. Yet, unbeknownst to the king, Sargon was plagued by a strange, recurring dream. Ishtar, the goddess of war, appeared to Sargon in his sleep and promised him extraordinary things. One day, she said, he would be king not only of Kish, but of all the land between the Euphrates and the Tigris. Not realizing the weight of his words, Sargon told his master of the dream, and the king turned pale. Had the boy who served him every day truly been chosen by the goddess of war? Urza Baba could not allow this prophecy to come true. He banished Sargon to the desert, and in doing so, he convinced Sargon that the goddess had spoken truly. Yet banishment was not enough for the frightened king. He soon sent Kish's most vigorous warriors to ambush his former confidant among the dunes. I was one of those men. As a smith, I was the strongest, and when Urza Baba ordered me to swap my hammer for a sword, I accepted, but not without hesitation. By now, the tale of the banished servant and his dreams had spread far beyond the royal palace. Many who suffered under Urza Baba's rule saw Sargon as a savior. When I finally caught up with him at a remote well, he was resting in the shade. I left my sword in its scabbard and faced a man who showed no fear. 
In his mind, he was no longer a simple servant. He was indeed Ishtar's chosen one. Urzababa has sent assassins to kill me? How would you know that if you are not one of them yourself? You are perceptive, Sargon. I understand why Urzababa fears you so much. But there is no time to talk. Let me prove my loyalty to you. There is the traitor called Sargon. What are you waiting for, Shar? Help us hunt down the renegade. Urzababa will send more assassins. We cannot stay here, but I know of two villages where we could hide for a while. Papadakis. Ivor Tade. Ivor Tade. Hone. It is Sargon, the Chosen One, who it is said will lead us Sumerians into a new age. You may stay with us as long as you wish, and we will support your cause. So, you are holed up in a seedy village, Sargon. My scouts oh, yes. are everywhere. You can escape neither my eyes nor your fate. Our market is open to you. Do not hesitate to send your merchants to us to trade. Urzababa rules not only Kish, but also Zippar and Borsippa. It is time that these places bowed to Ishtar's will. Rutger. Urzababa's forces have occupied several mines in this area. Humbus. We should seize them. Rogan? Alamas. Humbus. An attack on the heavily guarded southern gates of Kish will cost many lives. Our scouts report that the gates to the north are barely protected, however. An attack on the heavily guarded southern gates of Kish will cost many lives. Our scouts report that the gates to the north are barely protected, however. I was right! This man has come to kill me! Just as the prophecy foretold! The taste of death is upon my lips! All is lost! As we entered the royal palace in Kish, I swelled with joy and pride. Sargon had triumphed, and it seemed that this man, blessed by Ishtar, was truly invincible. Yet in my quiet moments, I wondered if it would ever have come to this if Urzababa had not expelled Sargon. Had we fulfilled a prophecy? Or had a simple dream become prophecy, only after the fearful king sealed his own fate? Dreams and oracles, visions and prophecies, it seems that these mysterious forces can be as dangerous to those who believe in them 
as they are to those who ignore them. Our soldiers often wondered where Sargon had actually come from. Some believed that he had descended from heaven, like the founder of Kish. Others said that he was an orphan who had been found in a basket floating on the Euphrates. I have even heard some townsmen say that he was the son of a priestess who had given birth without having ever lain with a man. Sargon only smiled at these rumors. He said that it does not matter where a man comes from, only where he goes, and that he himself follows the path that Ishtar shows him. That path led to war. With Kish subdued, Sargon sent his army to conquer the countless city-states of Mesopotamia in Ishtar's name. The masters of these cities scoffed at Sargon's ambitions, yet secretly, they all feared him. In order to match Sargon's army, they joined forces under the leadership of Lugal Zagisi, the priest killer. He was a brutal man, feared for his atrocities across the region. He would often desecrate the temples of the cities that he conquered. Yet, he was a capable tactician and a gifted commander, a suitable challenge for Ishtar's champion. 